Hello, Christian Livingstone here. And guess what I've got going right now, besides this video camera? I've got a project going, a couple of projects, but one project for my neighbor uh, right next door, uh, we do favors for each other, is a project involving his uh, motorcycle trailer. He's got a, uh, a real nice three-wheeled Harley Davidson. He's recently retired and he's got this big fancy groovy motorcycle uh, that Tim and his wife are gonna spend some time traveling and uh, for them it involves a, a trailer sometimes and you know it's got an enclosed shell but they're finding they'd like to have uh, something more added to it and uh, like I said we do some favors for each other and he's already done me the favor by filling up a, a big argon uh, gas bottle for me for part of the project but uh, no money's involved it's uh, stuff I like to do so we're gonna do him a, a, a good deed and uh, I'm gonna have some fun uh, getting a little creative too so I'll show you the trailer and I'll show you just uh, how easily it can be done. It's going to take some time. I've got another bigger project going too. I'm working on a truck I uh, obtained recently. Um, you know, it needs some attention and I'm all on it, under it, in it, through it. Uh, so that's really uh, where most of my time uh, is uh, free time is uh, focused right now and attention. But also at the same time, I'm going to do this project. Now, my neighbor uh, had uh, some thumb surgery, so he's not going anywhere on the motorcycle. It's not a, a big uh, rush. Uh, it'll probably be three months before he gets, he gets back on that motorcycle. So I've got plenty of time, but uh, I don't want to take too long. So anyway, I thought I'd just show you, you know, what uh, my process is. Uh, I don't have a shop, uh, so I'll be doing this pretty much out of a closet, just like I uh, built the electric hand cycle. Many of you are familiar with that uh, project, and uh, it's always fun to talk about it and, you know, ride the thing, and people seem to dig it. But uh, similar to that, this is a, a little creative uh, process that can be done out of almost any home. And uh, even if you don't really have the welding skills, you'll become familiar with uh, how welding and fabrication all comes together. Maybe we'll even uh, get into a little Christian theology. Okay, so this is it. It's a, really a laundry closet, laundry room, uh, very small, a little pantry up right here, and a nice little countertop. It's very dirty in here, and that's uh, usually how it is, but sometimes I sweep the floor. And this is really the, the real heart of this room right here, this welder. This is a, a DC welder. It, uh, it'll stick weld and uh, TIG weld. We'll do TIG welding in here. That's why uh, I do it indoors because TIG welding is a process that doesn't have any spatter. It's very quiet. Uh, into a little Christian theology. You know, because, uh, you know, human beings are more than animals. I mean, we have an animal nature and animals basically, their, their program, their function, their pattern, uh, follows uh, pretty unconsciously and, and sometimes humans are that way too they have an unconscious kind of a, a life but we humans are more than you know eating reproducing and dying that's pretty much the biological pattern of almost all, all organisms eat reproduce die it's just an endless mindless chain but in the Bible, uh, you know, and you don't have to be a Christian to believe that, you know, human beings are more than that. We're more than just the physiology, the biology, the drives, the urges, blah, you know, for food, you know, sex, and, uh, you know, territory, you know, you guard the home front and your den. <laughs> so, you know guys like Abraham Maslow 
articulated similar things. And, you know, once the biological things are taken care of, you move on to greater things, self-actualizing things, spiritual things. And uh, the Bible tells us uh, in the very early pages uh, uh, that uh, we're made in the image of God. And, uh, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, oh, God looks like us, you know. Christ told us that uh, God is spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But before you can even get to that point, there's something about us human beings that obviously is uh, more and better than the animal nature. And uh, since God is the creator, and actually the Bible tells us that uh, uh, it was Christ who entered humanity in what we call the Incarnation. Somehow he uh, uh, was the Creator himself. And, uh, you know, in the first chapter of uh, uh, John's Gospel and also the first chapter of uh, Paul's uh, letter to the Colossians, you know, it uh, emphasizes and makes it real clear and emphatic that uh, uh, Christ was the Creator of all things. Even though he entered humanity in time and space, it says he's before all things, uh, that he created all things, and that all things uh, were made by him and for him. And it actually says that uh, uh, he upholds all things by the word of his power. Now, you know, how he did that while he was a little baby, I, I don't know. But uh, there are speculations without getting into Trinitarian theology too much. Uh, the deity of Christ uh, is really the heart of, of, you know, Christian theology. If you don't believe in the deity of Christ, uh, you've got problems with the Bible because the Bible's pretty clear about who he is. Not only that he was a real human being, but that, you know, he never ceased to be God, even though he waived his rights to act as full deity. And that's what uh, the Apostle Paul mentions in the second chapter of Philippians in what's known as the kenosis passage. And kenosis is the ancient Greek term, uh, Koine Greek term, uh, kenosis for emptied. He emptied himself. It says he never ceased to be God, but that he emptied himself, you know, so he could be our kinsman redeemer. That was just something that God planned. He wanted to do it his way. He didn't want to just manufacture a, a person to do for him what he wouldn't do. No, God did it. And, uh, you know, he wasn't afraid to uh, do it himself. And that's a good thing. That shows us something about the character of God. You know, he didn't just manufacture somebody or send an angel. No, no. So anyway, uh, besides that, uh, we are in the image of God and beyond the animal nature. That means we, uh, we, we build things. We create things. We don't create things out of nothing. You know, God can do that. God can create things out of nothing. But we human beings don't create anything per se out of nothing. We, uh, we uh, more accurately, we discover things. We discover from existing things in nature and physics and chemistry uh, and physical laws like uh, avionics, aeronautics. Uh, you know, we didn't create flight. It was there waiting to be discovered. You know, you can discover the laws of physics about lift and thrust. And, you know, you can get a big hunk of metal flying and put people in it and move them through the air without dropping like a lead sinker. Okay, hey, here is that trailer, and uh, as you can see, it's got a pod, a shell, uh, for holding uh, most of the items. But this uh, section right here, this open section here, where it attaches to the uh, uh, Harley-Davidson, three-wheeled uh, trike Harley-Davidson, is where we're going to be focused, right there. And uh, this area is where my neighbor said that he wanted to place a cooler. He wanted me to build a small little tray platform uh, for a cooler that was uh, uh, originally proposed to be 
the size, you know, for one of those uh, six-pack coolers. Something small, because now he wants a bigger cooler to go in that section. Now, let me show you what, how much bigger I'm talking about. There's the cooler. You see that? That. But what I've come up with uh, is actually just making a simple tray, but uh, not only... He doesn't want me to drill into here. There's wires in here, and uh, he doesn't want me to weld to it either. So I'm going to clamp. I'm going to use uh, bolts much like this over here, except going downwards from, from the tray I built. But, you know, you could see that there's a difference between, you know, a little six-pack cooler there and a, that big old sucker. So uh, a little tray would have been easy to get enough strength here. But with the big one, I've got to come up, and what I've decided to do is tap into this square tubing down here. So, it's going to go something like this. It's going to insert right into the square tubing. And be something like this. Now, there'll be another cross member over there and, and across there, but that's the kind of the, uh, look this tray is going to have. And it's going to get uh, not so much weight bearing ability from these side rails, but it'll get stability so that when you're going down the road, it's not going to uh, vibrate from side to side and, and eventually break off or developed into, you know, really wonderful uh, things to help people. And even if we look at, you know, uh, biology and uh, agriculture, you know, we don't create anything. We don't really, in, in the reproductive cycle, uh, uh, you know, you don't create your children. You take existing materials and you start them. You put them into action. Uh, growth, you know, just like plant the seed, you know, we, uh, we can decide to have children, and uh, that's really not us creating, you know, the human race. The human race was already created, and uh, we just can start the process, like, uh, you know, growing, like penicillin was discovered by growing something. And, it's interesting how even uh, Christ uh, in the Bible, the uh, the miracles that uh, he did, he, he never uh, really created something out of nothing in those miracles. I don't know if that's just a limitation that God is placing on himself at this time or that time. And, you know, when it says uh, God made everything, uh, you know, on the seventh day he rested. And, you know, it may be that he's done, you know, with uh, creating out of nothing. But taking what exists and changing it. Okay, and this is what we're talking about. You can see the platform or the, the tray uh, extending out, and that's the uh, cooler. Originally it was uh, intended only to be a small six-pack style cooler, but when my neighbor got to thinking about it, he liked the idea of, of bigger and more, and uh, why not? Uh, but uh, we also want to be aware of the tongue weight at the end of the trailer there. That's the, the pressure or uh, pounds that are exerted down on the hitch. Because this is going to be uh, connected to a three-wheeled uh, uh, motorcycle, a uh, Harley-Davidson, a factory a trike. And, uh, you know, if you got too much uh, uh, weight pushing down on the, the tail end, it affects the steering and suspension, and uh, we want to minimize that. So I told him uh, that that, uh, that stand, that jack stand, uh, trailer stand, uh, is pretty bulky and pretty heavy. It rotates up underneath uh, when you're, you've got it hitched up and around the road, but you can see that... Uh, wheel down at the bottom that would flail around and make noise and you really don't need uh, uh, the wheel on there because when he moves it he doesn't push it from the back he just grabs the uh, the end there and lifts it up and pulls it it's, it's fairly light up front 
So uh, I told him I'm going to make a, uh, a kickstand, uh, a lighter, more elegant solution, uh, a little cleaner uh, in its design and execution. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it'll look better, too. When I say elegant, you know, sometimes, you know, the straight line instead of the zigzag is, is the better looking thing, too. It's, it's both uh, elegant in its design and execution but it has uh, a better look to it too. So underneath the uh, uh, cooler there I'm going to put expanded metal. You can see that you know the uh, angle iron flanges or, or rails hold the cooler up but still we're going to fill in that uh, empty space underneath the cooler with uh, this expanded metal here. This is uh, half inch it's a pretty tight weave and uh, uh, you know in case they want to place something else in their stowage uh, not the cooler uh, it'll be able to uh, contain uh, smaller looser items uh, without them dropping through of course and it's lighter expanded metal is uh, you know it's expanded it's got holes in it it doesn't weigh as much so it's pretty groovy stuff. I, I've always liked it. This is smooth. You can have it raised as well for traction, but uh, expanded metal is cool. Uh, taking what exists and changing it. If we look at the Bible in, in the New Testament, that's what Christ was doing. He, uh, you know, when he turned the water to wine, he didn't just make the wine out of nothing. He took the existing water and changed it. Uh, multiplying the bread and uh, fish, uh, the loaves, uh, you know, he theoretically could have just manufactured it out of nothing, but he didn't do that. He uh, took what was and uh, multiplied it. The, uh, oh, what else? Uh, there was a, uh, a guy who was uh, blind from birth and uh, obviously had no eyeballs in his eye sockets. And, you know, Christ didn't just go like this and say, hey, open your eyes. He didn't manufacture eyeballs out of nothing. He says he took, you know, dirt and spittle and stuck it in his eyeballs. Uh, so he, he put some, he used something that was existing. And, uh, you know, that's what we can do. We can do things with what we have. And so uh, that's what we're going to do with a little welding and fabrication. We're going to take some materials like steel, you know, we mine the uh, ore, we smelt the metal, and we have uh, a material that we can use. Now, I'm not going to do all that. I'm just going to take the store-bought stock and uh, we're going to cut it up. But uh, we're going to do some design. And that's really where things come out of nowhere. You know, they come out of here. And uh, we're going to come up with some designs that have never been done before. And uh, that's kind of the image of God stuff, I think. Uh, you know, that's the creative process. We don't take stuff out of nothing and create stuff out of nothing. Uh, and even God doesn't seem to be doing much of that lately. But he does seem to be taking uh, what he's already created and changing, designing, making things. And, you know, in the, the New Testament, Christ, after the resurrection, you know, went on to say, you know, behold, I, I make all things new. And he talks about a new heaven and new earth. And those terms aren't talking about uh, something uh, another or a different. It's talking about the same earth, but just the term is to be renewed, uh, rejuvenated. So he, he takes what is and makes it better. And I believe that's all fulfilled now for those who believe. There is a change of nature in a lot of people. You know, the, the proud and arrogant, you know, the lambs uh, becoming more courageous and the lions becoming more sheep-like. It's a change of nature for, for those who believe. For the rest, no. It's uh, still law of the jungle stuff. So what I'm doing is I'm welding the nuts uh, that will be inserted into that square tubing to give the, the out, outward uh, stabilization uh, 
And uh, that way, when we insert those into the square tubing, we don't have to wonder, you know, how do we hold the nut inside there? We're going to uh, tack them uh, pretty, pretty good on a couple of sides. We don't have to go around the whole thing. Sometimes less is more, and if you put too much heat on something, uh, especially like these, these are uh, self-locking uh, nuts. They don't have the nylon in it, but they got a little drag built into the thread. So we're just going to put a, a couple of beads on uh, two sides of these nuts so, you know, when we insert them in there, then when we come up underneath the trailer at that square tubing, we don't have to worry about a second wrench. And you can do this with the bolt heads or the nuts. It's uh, kind of a handy thing to, uh, you know, weld uh, one or the other of them. That way you can just zip up with uh, one wrench and uh, you're good to go. So. Uh, I think everything's ready. Of course, uh, we've got our ground uh, on our uh, work, and uh, I've got about 114 amps set on this and filler rod, so let's just go for it. Uh, like I said about how you can uh, weld nuts, uh, you can maybe see it down here. Nut right on there, you just weld the nut on. Also, the bolts you can do the same. And underneath here, uh, you can see I've got them clamped in the proper alignment that I want. But uh, what's happening is I, I've drilled holes up top here. So I've taken the bolts, I've cut off the heads. I also like to say that. Cut off the heads. But, uh, and you just drop them right in the slot. And uh, I've uh, uh, clamped them in place. And I went ahead and drilled them all the way through instead of just welding them underneath. Because this has actually two layers. There's a little piece of angle iron scapped on underneath. And I didn't want to weld it to that because I really want it pulling from the top where, where the integrity is. So I think you can see those two flush holes. I've got them. I'm going to weld them. I'm going to just put a bead around it. I'll grind it off smooth. You probably won't even be able to see that they're welded down in there, but uh, you'll know how it's done. Okay? a change of nature for, for those who believe. For the rest, no. It's uh, still law of the jungle stuff. So I'm going to show you this trailer and I'm going to, uh, I've already cut some of these uh, pieces of angle iron just to kind of create the basic framework and show you. I'll uh, take us over to the uh, trailer itself and uh, have a look at it and see what, uh, uh, what the customer, so to speak, the client, my neighbor, uh, was seeking. And uh, we're going to see if we can uh, come up with a, a design that will uh, really kind of wow him and uh, we'll have a lot of fun doing it too. But uh, to begin with, uh, these are the tools I've used already. Simple tools that anybody can use. You know, w the welding maybe you won't be able to do, but uh, uh, to begin with, you can uh, go about uh, getting the framework done with just these simple tools. Now. My welder has a plasma cutter built into it. A plasma cutter is great, cuts stuff fast and pretty clean lines. 
but uh, to get my plasma cutter outdoors, you know, because it throws a lot of sparks and slag around, is an extra uh, bit of work. And it takes a, uh, uh, a compressor to be hooked up too. So what I do is I just come outside here and I've got a little, little mini bench with a, a vise uh, and that's where I do most of my cutting. It's a slower process to use a jigsaw with a uh, metal metal bit but uh, it cuts real cleanly very accurately and uh, you know most people don't realize that you know a little jigsaw like this can cut steel uh, quite well this is an uh, eighth inch uh, steel and you know it cuts a little slow but it's uh, quite clean and then then you can touch it up with a grinder and of course we're good on protection and I've had some time to get back to this little project and uh, here's the other part. Guess what this is. It's not a better mousetrap. And it's not a transformer robot. Anyway, this is the front portion of the uh, trailer hitch where the uh, uh, stand is. I made it like a kickstand and uh, it's spring loaded because uh, my neighbor said on the old mechanism, this sucker's heavy too. This is really for a, a full size uh, car, truck, uh, trailer, jack stand. And, uh, you know, it uh, raises and lowers just like my kickstand thing here. But, you know, the, the wheel flails around and the mechanism isn't spring loaded except where you lock it in. So my neighbor said he would wrap a bungee cord around it after he rotated it up when he got ready to hit the road. And, you know, that's just another thing when you're going to embark, disembark, bungee cords, all this extra, you know, stuff, gear. And uh, so not only is this sucker heavy, it's, it's just more than a, a motorcycle trailer really calls for. But that's what he used. So this, a lot lighter. I mean, tons. So what I did was I, I put the uh, spring mechanism here. These are tension springs, and there's a uh, compression spring built into the uh, pop pin. But I like this design, uh, you know, way back when, not when I was a kid, because this is basically just a kickstand mechanism. I got the pin. It's pretty stiff sprung. You can see it sets up like that. And then to go back, these two uh, handles, I've got some foosball handles that'll go on it, but uh, it doesn't lock in the front. It doesn't need it. Uh, when the weight's on it, it's there. It's forward enough that it's not teetering close, and the spring tension keeps it forward, too. But from here, you can just let me grab it here. You can see the, uh, the locking mechanism just ramps right up and automatically catches because it uh, it ramps up very smoothly and I'm pretty happy with that mechanism so when he's riding down the road not only is the spring tension holding these legs or arms up uh, the uh, pop pin is holding it locked but uh, no wiggle no need for bungee cords going around but anyway I like this uh, mechanism uh, not just because it's a simple kickstand mechanism and anybody can do this if you've got about 90 degrees as long as you put a tension spring and it breaks over center you can you can use this design but uh, I liked it when I used to do millwright work not for a kickstand but this same mechanism was used uh, and is used by uh, uh, diverter valves like a Y gate only instead of sweeping down underneath there's a, a plate mechanism that flaps to one side and the other and the spring is just on the other end and uh, it's a like a Y downwards but this big plate flaps on on either side and usually the engineer uh, on these projects uh, I would be working on would have these pre-made uh, diverter valves and uh, for some reason on one of these projects uh, his source for those diverter valves was not available or there was some 
problem with availability. And uh, he actually designed one up and just said, uh, you know, and my boss handed me the, the plans and said, you know, here, make this. And this was a big sucker. This was like a 50 pound, you know, quarter uh, plate uh, diverter valve. And, uh, you know, it was, it was cool. Uh, so I got to make it and implement uh, the springs that the uh, engineer had uh, uh, called for in the design. And I, I always liked it. I always looked for an opportunity to integrate this into some other thing. And here it is. But there was another time I, I almost used it uh, on this big uh, mailbox I, I made uh, a dozen or so years ago. It was a stockpiling mailbox with some big tube and you know if you've seen the old NJT newsletters uh, you, you might remember it but uh, I almost used that in the closure on the uh, mailbox but instead I used uh, a big heavy welding magnet inside the thing and it just went up to the magnet and closed real securely so that was really the more elegant thing but I, I've always wanted to uh, put this uh, in some design here it is. So anyway, uh, the platform for the cooler is on the unit, is on the trailer, and it's painted up. Uh, uh, that's all I, I really need to do on this to finish this, is uh, paint it and then install it. But I thought I'd have it out here so you could see it and kind of articulate it a little bit and get an idea before it's painted. It'll be black, and then you'll kind of lose, you know, the contrast of everything that's going on here so it'll go actually onto this forward piece here this is the actual hitch and it's going to use the existing holes the uh, neighbor did want you know where possible any new holes drilled so I'm just going to use these and it works great and uh, so that's what I'll do maybe I'll uh, install this before get one last fit up on it before I paint it, install it, and show you how it kind of swings up and down and show you the uh, platform where the cooler is going to go. And I, uh, I tapered it uh, more just to fit the cooler because really this is all about uh, designing around a cooler of, of all things. Okay, so here it is. The cooler, the trailer, the platform for the cooler, uh, there's the hitch and there is the the stand the kick stand it's uh, up uh, actually the trailers resting on the, the bench there so you can see underneath on the hitch that's how it'll be going down the road retracted or up let me move to the other side and show you the mechanism okay here it is again you see if it's high enough that it'll swing down there. Yes, that's how it works. And then to uh, retract it, you just push it back up, automatically locks in place. But again, I'm using my left hand, but uh, a right-handed person would be standing and forcing it down in a, a, a better, uh, way to force it but uh, let's see if I can do it with my left let's see. yeah yeah no problem at all so even though these handles are located pretty close to the the fulcrum area uh, it still gives you enough leverage to just push it back the spring tension still pretty pretty stiff but uh, um, you know obviously if you had a handle back here it'd be much easier but uh, this is pretty pretty good yeah no problem at all okay so I'm liking that uh, let's go ahead and put it the footprint down on the ground get it off the, off the bench so that's what it'll be like on the ground and he's got this swivel hitch too I put these uh, tarp straps on here with this uh, uh, clip I uh, welded up this clip so it also has a ring fitting 
to secure the uh, cooler so there's you know you don't have to put any of those ratchet straps or anything this is built right into it I'll put the cooler on right now and show you how this will strap on without adding needless extra gear There's a two-handed uh, pull, but uh, I don't know. The tension's pretty good. I wouldn't put anything uh, extra on there to hold it down, especially if it's loaded up with ice and drinks and stuff. I think that's a pretty clean execution of how the cooler should be fastened, how it sits. Uh, this uh, platform is very, very stable. So I'm liking it. The hitch, the stand, like I said, I put these uh, bicycle cables. They won't dangle around going down the road. Here's the old safety chains. These will go on the track. Goodbye. Some tools uh, here that I thought I'd show some of the younger people out there. If they're wondering how this stuff can be done, you know, apart from that welder inside my, my little... Uh, laundry space there you know the tools are fairly simple these uh, angle grinders and dremels and, and sanders and some hand tools like this non-power tools but uh, a lot of cutting can be done with the cutting uh, uh, wheel on these grinders and a flap disc uh, you know it doesn't take a lot of tools and a lot of uh, inventory of materials to, to get this stuff done you know it, if you've done it before, you can take some tips from a guy like me or somebody else in the neighborhood. Just about every other guy with a pickup can, can weld pretty good. So, uh, besides that, I, I, you know, thought I could somehow integrate that uh, uh, idea of the deity of Christ in with welding and fabrication. I mean, it, it's kind of tricky to try, try to get all that together on a video but uh, why not uh, and I guess that really started not too long ago uh, I was involved in a, a dialogue uh, with a, a gal who befriended me on Facebook and uh, uh, she seemed pretty sincere and everything and you know kind of Christian centered and uh, but she had kind of an axe to grind with uh, the doctrine of the Trinity and you know in the New Testament the Bible doesn't really you know, articulate the doctrine of the Trinity. It leaves clues to it, and a lot of people have a, a problem with the Trinity. I, I think it's clearly hinted at, and uh, is really the best, uh, mm, the best theory going about the nature of God, as if you know, we can really put God in a box and say, "Yep, yeah, that's that's what He is. That's His nature," and you know, we've got that settled now. But uh, she had a, a problem with the doctrine of the Trinity, and come to find out, uh, she was from Spain, you know, living here uh, in the Detroit area, and, you know, she had about 300 friends from Spain, so, you know, I, I knew she had probably Roman Catholic background, and she did admit that, uh, you know, she had a problem with the Roman Catholic Church, and so not only did she have a problem with the doctrine of the Trinity, but uh, she took it even one step further, and threw out the proverbial baby with the bathwater, and that baby would be the deity of Christ. She was denying the deity of Christ, yet still trying to hold on to the New Testament uh, writings uh, as though they also denied the deity of Christ. And it's completely ridiculous. And if you go into the writings of the New Testament, you know, even if you don't agree with them, you reject them. Uh, a lot of people do. Uh, but you know, it's pretty obvious that they supported the deity, that is, the divinity. A deity is just a Latin term, and you know, you can call it divinity, or the Theos, the Elohim, whatever you want, but uh, the divinity of Christ. That, uh... Okay, there's one little look from afar of how it'll look going down the road, pretty much. I think I'll put some little housing around those wires and kind of couple them together so they don't get all 
bound up in that mechanism somehow. So, it's looking good. Project completed virtually, except for the paint. I have the owner come back and uh, take it away. But about the uh, the deity of Christ again, uh, one little last tidbit on that uh, uh, Philippians passage, uh, chapter 2, the kenosis passage. Uh, it talks about kind of the paradoxical thing about how Christ was divine. He never stopped being God, but when he took on that humanity, uh, he didn't seek to grasp after being equal with God. And, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a human lesson in that, too, I think, uh, in how some people, you know, are people pleasers, and nobody really respects a people pleaser. And, you know, I'm sure God doesn't either, you know. We try to prove something, some grand gesture to God, that, oh, you know, God will really love me. And, you know, the only thing that can really please God is, is God himself. And, and that's why the deity of Christ is, is philosophically, it's an important point. Because uh, the atonement of Christ, you know, what kind of a sacrifice could be acceptable to God? Would it be just some uh, manufactured human being? Could a plain old man just uh, represent all of humanity and take away the sins uh, of the whole human race? No, no. But it had to be a human being, you know. I mean, I suppose a, a, a human being could atone for the sins of, you know, a German shepherd. But uh, who has the value of the whole human race? Who would be worthy or worth enough to actually atone for the sins of the whole world? Would an angel? No, I don't think so. An angel is just a created being. But how about the Creator? If somehow the Creator could take upon the form of humanity, be a perfect human, and still be divine, how about His atoning sacrifice? Absolutely. Makes perfect sense to me. I mean, in, a, in an equitable sense. And, you know, human beings have a, a sense of equity, and so obviously God must have some. I mean, you got to be careful about projecting back on God and not being all carnal about it, saying, oh, you know, we're carnal, so God's a man too. And, oh, look, we're carnal, and so everything, God endorses all our carnality. No, no. But, uh, you know, things about his character, you know, the non-carnal stuff, the, the character stuff. Uh, like Christ said, uh, uh, he, he was speaking to the Jews of his day, and he said, you know, though you're evil, uh, you know, you know how to give your children, uh, you know, good gifts. Uh, and so how much more does your Heavenly Father know how to give good gifts? And so, you know, in that sense, uh, we can say that, you know, God has a sense of equity. You know, it's not a carnal thing. It's a, a, a character, a, a sense of fairness. So, uh, and this gets back also to blood covenants, you know, entering into blood covenants. Who can be a, a, a kinsman redeemer? You know, it's got to be somebody who can, you know, be one of us and, and still represent the whole human race. And, you know, if Christ was just a, a, a really great man, one perfect man, you know, he could atone for himself or some maybe one other person or, you know, just he himself live, live forever and, uh, you know, everybody point to him, you know, and say, well, look, one guy did it, you know, good for him. Or that one guy might say, well, you know, I did it, I've arrived, I have the ability to, you know, hand this off to one other person so I'll sacrifice my life so that you know my brother can live you know just one for one you know unless the value of uh, Christ himself was uh, worth that of the whole human race and not just a puppy <laughs> that's my landlord's little doggy so uh, 
that's another point, a uh, sense of equity, uh, atoning uh, work, uh, why it's, uh, it follows that Christ would be divine and still be human, you know, for the sense of the uh, atoning work, uh, the redeeming work, and, uh, you know, what's acceptable to God. With You know, God uh, presumably, uh, I believe, uh, is perfection, you know, that's what he can accept, per perfection, and that's why, you know, we accept Christ uh, as our uh, Savior, as our Redeemer, because he, you know, had what it takes, and, you know, we fall short from that, but, uh, you know, somehow God has said, no, it's okay, you accept him, I accept him, and uh, all is well. It's pretty nice today for the dead of winter. Nice to have my hand back, I want to tell you. And these are my neighbors, Bruce and Leanne, and their big old Harley three-wheeler. So here's the trailer. Yippee! Right, and, and here's a surprise from a belated Santa, but a New Year's gift. Uh-oh, beer. That's one of my favorites. Beer kind of beer. That's one of my favorites. Hey, thanks, pal. You're welcome. You All right. to set it up there? Yeah, sure. Don't get any fingerprints on that. <laughs> and a little dessert to go with it. Oh, yippee. Snacks. Super. Hope you're not diabetic. What's that? You're not diabetic, right? No, of course not. <laughs> All right, you want to get to the nuts and bolts of this thing? Sure. All right. Sure. I'm going to let you guys just go to it uh, and see how intuitive it is for you and, yeah. and ergonomic, unless you want uh, some help. I... No, that looks, that looks good. That looks good. And I think the weight is pretty good, all things considered. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, you know, it's about as uh, uh, elegant a solution as possible. Okay. This is strapped down your cooler. Oh, I didn't break Oh, the lock? I'm, I'm, I haven't used it for as long. I couldn't remember if I had it attached or not. Oh. Like uh, John's gospel, he begins, you know, in the beginning, which harkens back to in the beginning God from Genesis, or in the beginning, what the Jews call in the book. And uh, But it says, in the beginning was the word. And uh, the apostle John, you know, just about any analogy you make to God breaks down because, you know, you can't really compare God to anything use these human terms and analogies and father son but they all break down you know god's not a mommy a daddy and he didn't have a baby and all that stuff but uh you know we got to use something to convey and and we do we we use those uh, analogies and, and they do convey what what apparently god thinks is fitting enough to uh, uh draw a conclusion but you know when Bible tells us that God is a consuming fire, you know, we got to say, well, he's not really a consuming fire, but we get the idea, he, you know, he should be respected and, you know, like a, a, a real fire on, on earth in a carnal, tangible, material sense, uh, God's uh, fire is very helpful, you know, but it can be very destructive too, and, you know, we should use care and, and caution. So that's conveyed in the Bible with these analogies of God as a consuming fire, and Father, Son, these anthropomorphic terms. Uh, but we still, we, we should understand that, uh, you know, it's difficult to talk about God, you know. But anyway, John takes a, a stab at it with a, with a new analogy uh, and a new term that uh, he uses in uh, his first few verses in gospel and he 
he says, in the beginning was the word. And that, that was, uh, you know, that, that was pretty, pretty clever to me because a word, what is a word? It's, it's nothing tangible. You can't, uh, you can't touch a word. It has no shape. I mean, you can write a word on a chalkboard, but it just indicates something else. But he says, in the begin beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And so, you know, wow, what's all that? Some people who deny the deity of Christ will point to that uh, uh, little phrase there and say, well, you know, there's the direct article, you know, in the beginning was theos, you know. Greek, uh, they used Theos, the Christians did, because they didn't want to use Zeus, you know, you know in the beginning with Zeus, that, that would have a problem. So they used Theos, and uh, in, in the Greek language, uh, New Testament Greek at least, there's no uh, upper and lower case letters, there's no capitals, so, you know, they're all capitals in Greek, and uh, they have what they use to denote a, like a capitalization is the direct article. So, you know, some people say, well, you know, you should, you could translate it so that it wouldn't imply that Christ is God there, but that's not true at all. The, the scholars are, are agreed that, you know, you could translate it also. Uh, in the beginning was the God with the article, and, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You know, you could say the Word was God, and he was with the God. So he's of the same nature. He's divine. But uh, John doesn't stop there, and uh, he goes on to say that uh, all things were created by him, and without him, not anything that was made was made. It's talking about Christ. And uh, Paul says the same thing in uh, the first chapter of Colossians. He said, all things were made by him. And uh, the people who deny the deity of Christ have a real problem with that verse. And that's what I emphasize to this, this woman uh, a lot. I touched on all the other places where Jesus is the I am and um, uh, other places where he's called God and uh, where God even, where God the Father calls God, uh, Christ uh, God. And he says, let all of God's angels worship him, you know. And so if you do a, a search in your concordance or biblical software on worship, you'll find, you know, a big stack of dozens of places where Christ is worshipped. And, you know, that would be blasphemy if he were not divine. So in the places in the Bible where it says that uh, all things were created by Christ, obviously he can't create himself. And uh, it's not talking about just his humanity in the womb uh, 2,000 years ago. It's talking well before that. But uh, this woman actually said that, so, you know, Christ is not only not divine, she was saying that he didn't even exist before the womb. And uh, she was mostly using uh, arguments by a guy. She was copying and pasting some some uh, text uh, from it. I, I know the guy. I was a little surprised to see him uh, uh, denying the deity of Christ, but uh, they were mostly arguments borrowed from the Watchtower organization, but even the Watchtower doesn't go as far as to uh, say that uh, Christ uh, didn't pre-exist before the Incarnation. They say, well, yeah, he existed. Uh, he's not God. He's, you know, in, in that passage of John, they say he's a god. Since a direct article isn't used, they say he's a god, little g. So they claim to be uh, uh, monotheists, but they're actually polytheists. They believe Jehovah is the big god and Christ is the little god. They've got a real, real problem with uh, their consistency logically and in the translation, and they just butcher the text. And not only do they butcher the text on a God uh, creating a, a polytheistic religion, they, in, in those places where it says all things were created by him, they don't just insert an A, they insert a whole other word to get out of it. They say he created all other things. And it's not in any text anywhere. 
because they have that problem. You know, if Christ created all things, he can't be one of the things created. So, you know, this gal had that same problem that the Watchtower did, and uh, I pointed that out to her, and, and she tried to get out of it by saying, well, yeah, that means he created uh, the new heavens and the new earth, you know, which undoubtedly she was a futurist, believing they're still out there in the future, so, you know. It's pretty clear that uh, the Bible teaches that Christ is the creator of all things. Even all right, there it is. Maybe, yeah, maybe I should try to put it back on so you can get a film of putting a yeah, camera on. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, maybe I should try to put it back on so you can get a film of putting a yeah. <laughs> Do whatever you want. No, I just mess it. I'm not gonna do it. But that that's again. it. My thumb's tired. The only thing I didn't get that's polished it. on the bike is the the rims. I didn't have time. Yeah, Charlie, so don't you slobber on there. All just, hooked up. Things, even though he came to Earth as a humble servant and accepted uh, virtually all the limitations uh, except where he relied on God the Father or the Holy Spirit to give him insight and uh, you know produce the miracles he said you know the Father's doing it through me you know it's not me and he said the Father's greater than I am you know and not that he's better than I am but he did accept the limitations he was uh, lower in position the Bible says Christ was made a little lower than the angels not that he was by nature you know lesser not as good as the angels he was just like us we're, we're on equal footing now in our humanity that way but uh, it doesn't mean that Christ ceased to be who he really was and that's the the funny thing about the Philippian chapter there, the kenosis passage, what they call it, because it, it comes from the, the term uh, kenosis in Greek, which is to empty. Christ emptied himself of his right to act of deity, and in, in so doing, uh, Paul says, you know, let that same mind be in you, you know, not to seek to grasp after being equal with God. He, he didn't have to, because he was. And in his humanity, even though he was, he didn't seek to grasp after that equality that he had by nature. And it says, so God gave him a name which is above every name. He, this is to the humanity of Christ. And uh, he said, uh, so that every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord or divine. He's the, the Yahweh of, of the Old Testament. Uh, because it's a quote out of uh, Isaiah 45, and Paul uses it also in uh, Romans 14. He said that that belongs to God, and there's lots of other titles that Christ is uh, uh, assigned and implied. That uh, those are only titles for, for divinity, especially in the Book of Revelation. It's real heavy with it, uh, uh, with uh, things like uh, the Alpha and the Omega. The there's, there, there isn't two of those. You know, there's only one of those. And those are things only God uh, uh, can have ascribed to him. And, and what's blasphemy if, if Christ is a divine. So, you know, you should pretty much throw away the whole Old Test, uh, New Testament if you want to uh, deny uh, the deity of Christ. But if you're like me, you know, you, you like the teachings of Christ, you trust uh, the authorship of uh the New Testament writers and, and what they had to say, uh, you accept it. You know, how could God do it? I don't know. I don't know. But it's what he wanted. And, uh, you know, most of the people that read the teachings of Christ do dig it. And uh, even, you know, people that don't accept, you know, Christ as the Messiah, some, some religious Jews even, you know, like the teachings of Christ. They will say, well, he's not the Messiah. Fine, but uh, they have a, a real reverence for the teachings of Christ. Some, you know, most Muslims accept uh, uh, the teachings of Christ as the great prophet, and even uh, atheists will accept the teachings of Christ as very humanizing, very self-actualizing, very peace-loving. You know, not everybody's a, a statist. You know, Heil Hitler for the state. Uh, they understand that uh, the teachings of Christ are very subversive to the world order. That's why Christ was crucified, because uh, he has a better way than the current way. 
So I think that's where I'm going to uh, end with uh, the teachings of Christ. You can take this to great lengths and uh, do your own study. You know, they're readily available uh, uh, works on the deity of Christ. Uh, basic, it's basic stuff. Uh, you know, it's about the only thing I think that is a cardinal doctrine. You know, Christ Himself said uh, that if you believe not that I am, you will die in your sins. You know, that's not just bad grammar. That's that's good theology. And, uh, you know, dying in your sins, I don't think, means, you know, oh, you got to hurry up and become a Christian before you die or you won't go to heaven. He's talking about something more existential in the here and now. You know, about, you know, a missed opportunity in this one and only life. So, uh, I think I'll end... Uh, all the, the talk about the deity of Christ uh, but you know where it began for me was you know in the early 80s uh, I did some uh, apologetics uh, you know as an early Christian or early Bible student uh, at least uh, with uh, uh, like books like the kingdom of the cults and uh, the, the deity of Christ the, the biggest people who try to assault the deity of Christ while still holding on to the, the teachings uh, supposedly of the New Testament is the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And then there's uh, Victor Paul Werewolf's uh, group, uh, The Way International. They do similar things. And there was the Worldwide Church of God with Herbert W. Armstrong. They were Watchtower-like on uh, the deity of Christ. But... Uh, you know, the New Testament's uh, quite clear, and the scholarship uh, down through the ages is quite clear, too. And, you know, even the, the Roman Catholics uh, didn't get that wrong. You know, of course, they've gotten a lot of things wrong, and the church, their church, has done, you know, some terrible things, especially uh, assisted by the state when they got together. But that doesn't mean, you know, uh, they were wrong about the deity of Christ. Uh, Bible's pretty clear, and the Bible record was around long before the Roman Catholic Church was created, you know, by pretty much uh, Caesar uh, Constantine in 312 A.D. when he legalized Christianity and invited the clergy, uh, you know, to be a state corporation and share in the power. That began the Roman Catholic Church as far as I'm concerned. Okay. So there it is, the happy conclusion of a project for a neighbor with the uh, motorcycle trailer and uh, also uh, the conclusion hopefully uh, of the deity of Christ topic. Uh, my argument was that the Bible espouses the deity of Christ, not you know whether you believe it or not, just that the Bible espouses it. I of course believe it, I'm a Christian and uh, that uh, one doctrine is about the only really critical doctrine, I think, in, in all of Christendom is uh, the deity of Christ. Uh, if you don't believe who he is, uh, you know, you, you probably got the wrong Christ, the wrong gospel, the wrong, you know, just about everything. So, but if you've got that one central uh, fact right, uh, you know, I think everything else will fall into place. Uh, that's what the Bible's really in the New Testament is, is all about, is the preeminence of Christ. He is before all things, above all things, so that in everything he can have the preeminence. So, you know, for somebody to come along and say, well, oh no, the Bible doesn't teach he's God. No, it, you know, it's pretty ridiculous. And, there's only a couple of few groups that do it. And they, they've surfaced in the last hundred years or slightly more. Uh, the Watchtower with the Dawn Bible students and the Way International in the last 30, 40 years maybe. Mormons too, in a way, they uh, belittle the deity of Christ, not by saying he's not a god. They believe everybody becomes a god. So uh, that's how they take away his preeminence for for the Mormons, Jesus was the spirit, his pre-incarnate uh, person was the spirit brother of Lucifer, you know. Oh, goody. 
And they be, believe they'll become a god too. They originally uh, uh, espoused that Adam was God. You know, that's how carnal minded they are. They, you know, think God is just a man like the rest of us. And, you know, so of course they can become gods too and procreate and inhabit planets like the planet Kolob. And, you know, that's all they want to do is have sex and you know, go procreate, you know, like some of the old stories about them having all those uh, wives and stuff, you know, that was their thing. They have a right to believe whatever they want, I think, and actually do just about anything they want as long as they're not hurting anybody. But, uh, you know, when they start trying to suggest that the Bible really uh, talks like that, it, it doesn't. Polygamy, or polygamy, was used in the Bible, uh, but um, uh, polytheism never. That was the, the one thing that the Jews, the Christians, and the uh, Muslims could all agree on was there's there's only one God. And um, so that was my argument. The deity of Christ is espoused in the Bible, not whether you believe it or not. Of course I believe it. I'm a Christian and uh, I believe... Uh, that the Bible is uh, a reliable uh, witness to, to some of the events that happened so long ago. And, uh, uh, you know, you can't really objectively prove the existence of God any more than you can prove the existence of uh, the Big Bang and evolution, that everything was spontaneously popped out of nothing. And, gee, look, it's all orderly and balanced and sensible. Uh, how could that happen? You know, it didn't have a reason, didn't have a creator. You know, we know that, you know, whatever chaos momentarily creates, chaos also destroys immediately. So, you know, you can get the proverbial monkey on the typewriter uh, uh, to produce, you know, to be or not to be, and then jubu jubu baba jubu. So that's what atheists, they've got a lot of faith. So that was my argument. Uh, the deity of Christ is espoused in the Bible, whether you believe it or not. You know, believing something doesn't make it so. And, uh, you know, just because you feel like it's true doesn't make it more true either. No. But, uh, you know, as a Christian, I, after having read the Bible from cover to cover, uh, uh, a few times more and more than one translation, especially the New Testament. But, uh, you know, the prophecies are pretty, pretty uh, convincing when you think about how they uh, uh, espouse the coming of a, of a person, namely Christ the Messiah, and how he fulfilled all that stuff uh, in the book of Isaiah and uh, the Psalms and other places. Uh, so well, how he'd be, uh, you know, divine yet a man of suffering, and uh, you know, it, it was even to the point that the Jews thought there might be two messiahs, you know, the the glorious one and the suffering one. So you know, it's, there's a duality in the Bible, and uh, after you uh, read, uh, you know, the teachings of Christ, the sayings of Christ, and uh, you know, you start to reconcile that duality a little bit. And uh, again, getting back to the uh, uh, first chapter of John, where uh, John uh, uh, calls the pre-incarnate Christ the Word, that is also a kind of an allusion back to the Old Testament, where, uh, you know, there was a, a, a kind of mysterious phrase used when God would communicate to uh, those uh, Old Testament patriarchs and other people, uh, you know, it would be a, a catchphrase that would go like, uh, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, go do thus and such. They're not going to listen to you. They're probably going to throw stones at you, but do what I'm telling you anyway. And uh, this, the, the word of the Lord came unto me. And uh, I think you'll, you'll find out if you do read the Bible uh, from cover to cover a few times after having read the New Testament, then you go back and you start hearing that that is probably, in most cases, many cases, maybe all cases, uh, the pre-incarnate Christ speaking. And so you start hearing, you know, 
God speaking in, in the pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament. And then, uh, you know, it, it becomes a more cohesive body of literature. But uh, for some still, it's kind of hard to reconcile that, that duality of the mean Jehovah God and the nice Christ, you know, of, of the New Testament. But then when you get back in, uh, even beyond that, uh, in the book of Revelation, it kind of gets back to that, uh, you know, fiery Christ, like old Jehovah God, you know, and he's called the, the first and the last, the beginning of the end. Uh, that's, that's old book of Daniel talk, and uh, sure enough, uh, Christ uh, picks up that language again, and uh, uh, for good reason. Like I said, Christ said, if you believe not that I am, you will die in your sins. So that's the one thing he does want us to believe. There's other things uh, I'm sure he wants us to believe, but none of them with that kind of imperative, you'll die in your sins. You know, Paul goes on to say things like, you know, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, then, you know, our faith is in vain. But that really doesn't require you to believe it. You know, if, if Christ is raised from the dead, physically, bodily, resurrected, I believe he was, then great, you know, we're, we're not in our sins. And if I don't believe that, some people, I suppose, don't. If I don't believe that, that doesn't change the fact that he might have been. Believing something doesn't make it so, and not believing something uh, doesn't make it untrue. So, uh, But Christ did uh, uh, give that imperative about believing who he was, if you believe not that I am. That's the divine name, not just bad grammar. And Christ used uh, the I am in a couple other places, and it it blew the pharisaical Jews back, and, uh, you know, it was clear he was pronouncing the divine name. Even though uh, Hebrew was a dead language at the time of Christ, uh, uh, they understood him clearly. So, what else can I say? Uh, you know, humanity is, uh, a lot of it is, uh, there's still a, unredeemedness about it and uh, you know that's tough to reconcile for the Christian we like to think well you know Christ you know the new day is dawned and you know everybody's getting better and better and you know his kingdom's gonna grow and grow and grow but no that isn't how it is it's you know it's still a personal uh, thing with individuals and uh, you know Christ's kingdom is here now, but, you know, it's, it's quite small, I think. Very few people have realized it, and uh, most of them are in statist idolatry. They worship the state. Oh, you know, they run to the state. Uh, some new president, let's go vote. He's going to make our lives wonderful, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they just get, you know, it's a shakedown and a scam, the state is. Uh, so we like to think that uh, uh, things are going to get better, but, you know, maybe they're not. Maybe, uh, you know, the world is just as dark a place as it's ever been. And, you know, there seem to be churches and crosses just about every block uh, in most major, major cities around North America. But, uh, you know, killing, bloodshed, coercion, extortion by the state primarily. That's the biggest, biggest one of all. Uh, keeps going on. And, you know, people keep getting married or giving in marriage, and uh, the human species just keeps uh, turning along and actually is uh, just growing at a, an exponential rate. Uh, I guess the equilibrium of humanity uh, for most of the, uh, its history has been about uh, 500 uh, million people on planet Earth uh, was the equilibrium for all of human history until about, uh, I don't know, 300 years ago. And uh, right around 1800, uh, for the first time in human history, there was uh, one billion people inhabiting the planet. One billion for the first time, you know, a couple hundred years ago. And then, of course, you know, 75 years go, go by and there's twice as many. And then half as long a time after that, there's twice as many as that. Now there's about seven billion. So it has been said, and uh, it'll probably continue to be a valid statement for the next hundred years or more, that uh, 
right now, half of all the human beings that have been born in human history are alive today. That's very interesting. Half of all the human beings that have ever been born in all of human history are alive right now. Yeah, I'm one of them. You're one of them. And the interesting thing, another interesting thing is, is that, you know, a hundred years from now, we're all going to be dead. Everyone, me, you, everyone we know, pretty much, more or less, everyone we know, including our kids, grandkids, uh, I don't have any kids myself, but, you know, you can pretty much say that, anybody can, that within a hundred years from now, you, me, and everyone we know will be dead. And no one alive in a hundred years will have known us. You know, they won't be able to say, you know, they, they can look at pictures and say, well, oh yeah, this was uh, Grandpa so and such, and you know, he used to be this or that, but nobody alive in a hundred years will have known us, or will know us, have known us. And, uh, you know, you can try to have as many kids as you want and, you know, kind of try to live on, carnally speaking. A lot of people do that, you know, uh, their legacy. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, having kids or many kids is it, not bad. It's, it's, you know, it's natural, of course, and, and normal, but uh, it's not spiritual. And uh, I, I think people would make a mistake if they thought, it's spiritual to, you know, do what any animal species is doing, thinking that that is uh, some kind of a spiritual service or doing God a favor. No, it's not. Because ultimately, it's it's the same. A hundred years from now, we're all going to be dead and nobody's going to have known us. Uh, but the interesting thing about Christ is that now, 2,000 years later, there are millions of people, myself included, who seem to have uh, a relationship with Christ and seem to know Him, though they've never even met Him personally at a carnal level. But here are all of these people, myself included, who seem to know this person Christ Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, uh, the only begotten one, uh, who became flesh and dwelt among us as a man, but yet was still divine. And uh, that's a fascinating thing. I mean, you know, the Bible doesn't talk about that uh, fact, but uh, it is. It's, it's kind of a, an inductive uh, evidence, I, I kind of think, of uh, the, the deity of Christ. It's, how that can be. I mean, most of us human beings can, you know, agree that, uh, you know, in a hundred years from now, uh, we're going to be dead and nobody will have known us who is still alive. And, you know, the people who did know us, they're gone too. So, you know, we go bye-bye. But uh, Christ is still here. You know, not just in the Christians, but in the fact that the Christians who continue from generation to generation seem to know him seem to have a relationship with him, and, you know, invisibly speaking, but uh, it, it's an interesting fact uh, that uh, uh, we can't say, we can't say, uh, you know, 100 years from now, 2,000 years from now, you know, people will continue to know us and have a relationship with us, but Christ has done that. Uh, he is uh, continuing to uh, uh, know people right here and now. Uh, some may be thinking, well, what's he talking about? You know, when we go to heaven, we'll know each other and, oh, everything will be groovy. And uh, a lot of Christendom uh, speaks in those terms. You know, Billy Graham, the great evangelist, you know, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? And don't you want to shun hell? You know, you better better get right with God or you're going to hell and you know you're going to miss out on heaven and hell. 
And, you know, to me, any talk of, you know, the afterlife uh, or the immortality of the soul is, is diminishing to the, the meaning of life now, you know, in, in this existence on, on planet Earth, our one and, one and only life. If we, you know, start thinking, oh, yeah, everything's going to be better, you know, then when we're dead, yeah, that's going to be great, you know. This is tolerable, you know, we obey the state, Heil Hitler, and, you know, be dupes for the hostile world system, you know, we'll get our reward later. And they'll get their, theirs too, you know, they'll get punished, we'll get our reward. And that's a very, I, I think, infantile kind of a fate to have. And so, you know, I, I never really speak of, oh, goody, I'm going to heaven when I die. You know, I don't know about heaven, and I'm pretty sure there there's no hell, but you know, I don't even know uh, uh, about heaven. You know, the, you know, anybody who says they can really speak authoritatively about it is, you know, some probably not to be listened to. Many of the places in the Bible that talk uh, about topics that seem to be talking about heaven really aren't at all. They're really, uh, I believe, uh, speaking more of uh, a dimension in the Holy Spirit in the here and now on this earth in Christ's kingdom, you know. Uh, most Christians, you know, read their Bibles or hear their preachers uh, teaching uh, uh, passages like, you know, in my father's house or many rooms. If it were not so, uh, you know, I would have told you, but, you know, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be also. And, you know, 99% of those people are hearing that and are being told that and thinking, oh goody, when I die, I get to go there. You know, Jesus is making a room and a mansion for me, you know, in, in Father's house. And wow, won't that be nice, you know, when I'm dead. I get to go to Father's house and, you know, I'll have my own mansion, my own room. It literally said, in, in my Father's house are many rooms, you know, some translations in my father's house are many mansions, you know, you can't fit a mansion inside a house, it's just, it's just kind of an awkward translation, but in my father's house are many rooms. So to me, uh, and I think the intention of, of Christ there is in my father's house are, are many rooms, it's uh, speaking about a place, uh, a dimension, uh, the giving of the Holy Spirit, where we can be in father's house now. We don't have to wait until we're dead. We don't have to wait till for a millennial utopia or Armageddon or, you know, uh, the Jews to set up their temple again since they've been kicking out the Palestinians. Sooner or later they might build a temple there and start animal sacrifices. Goody, goody, uh, I think not. So uh, those are all carnal-minded uh, interpretations, I believe, and... Uh, so, you, you know, I don't talk about heaven or hell much. You know, I, I, that's not the reason why, you know, I'm a Christian, why I, I, you know, do what I can to follow the teachings of Christ in the best way I know how. Not because, you know, of the, the reward of heaven or the, you know, the threat of hell. You know, I don't think those are good reasons to be a Christian. And uh, if there is no hell, no heaven, uh, you know, I'd still be a Christian, you know. And uh, I suggest that you might consider also, if you're a Christian, to start looking at things like that. You know, look at uh, life in the here and now. You know, let the afterlife stuff worry about itself. If you get things right in the here and now, then that other stuff will take care of itself. And, you know, now is really all you have. Unless you want to be ridden with guilt or be, you know, plagued by anxiety. Now is what you have, you know. And uh, with the dimension of the Holy Spirit, uh, I believe we can meet God in that dimension, in the here and now. You know, maybe it's not a, a big, ooh, emotional thing. You know, some people want to dictate to God, you know, what the relationship should be like, you know. Oh, God, I want to feel you. I can't wait till I'm dead so I can go feel you and be with you and sit in front of you and weep and cry and moan and oh, oh, oh and then you'll make it all better. It's nonsense, nonsense. Let's, let's get it all out now. 
let's, you know, let's see the righteousness and justice uh, uh, now. And, uh, you know, let's call evil for what it is. You know, let's look at the world system uh, objectively and, and, and not be a hypocrite about it and say, well, you know, it's, it, if it's wrong for me to do uh, what, you know, these police officers and politicians do and robbing people and taking from them and throwing them into prison and trying to, you know, uh, force them into going overseas and killing people, uh, you know, if it's wrong for me to do that, it's wrong for them to do that. And so, you know, it creates a problem because, you know, we've been conditioned into a system that uh, says, no, that's fine. That's fine. You know, you can't do that. But if you put on a badge uh, uh, or a uniform, sure, it's okay. It's not mass murder when you do it that way. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I recommend. Uh, stay in the here and don't worry about uh, heaven when you're dead. You know, start living in heaven now. Be seated in heavenly places right now. You know, I think that's really what uh, the good news was about. Even in spite of some temporal difficulties that we might face in, in this life, that, uh, you know, we're with God and we're at peace even under persecution or tribulations or you know, whatever it is, we can be at peace. We don't have to wait till we're dead.